Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Guayanas Archipelago Management Board and the Council of the Haida Nation, I would like to welcome you to our first uh, virtual uh, speaker series. Today we're going to be uh, leading into a, a three-day total um, symposium that's going to look at what has happened to Haida Gwaii over the past couple of hundred years and hopefully look for some solutions. We're going to lead off today with the help of Andrew Wright from Simon Fraser University and I'd like to say Hawa Andrew for, for your work and for helping us um, show people what this is all about. So. Um, I'll turn it over to you, and uh, as time goes by, Nancy and I will join you, okay? And, and thank you again. It's good to see you. Thank you, Bob. Well, it's a privilege to be here with you all today, everybody. Before I get going, I should acknowledge that I'm on Bowen Island in the Salish Sea, and that is the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Schleidertooth, and Squamish nations, and uh, it's a privilege to live and work here. Um, I actually have a canned presentation for you today because with so many people online and bandwidth requirements we thought it would actually be a little bit more reliable despite our initial technical hiccups here. So I'm about to kick off an 18 minute presentation that takes care of itself for you. Um, there are two errors in it I found listening to it on playback. So uh, anybody first to notice grabs a bottle of wine and somehow I'll figure out how to get it to you. So the first, that's the first question when we get to question periods. So what are the two errors? So here we go, folks. I'm just going to kick you off with this one here. Share and from the beginning. Here we go. Hello, my name is Andy Wright. And I've had the privilege of working with the Haida Nation, Parks Canada, and Island Conservation photo documenting their work over the last decade. Their work, the, the removal of invasive species from remote seabird breeding islands is critical work in my mind because biodiversity loss and climate change are two sides of the same coin. That is hard Well, sorry folks, we've had a first hiccup. Um. On the planet. And when you reflect on the fact that 86% of known extinctions have happened on remote seabird breeding islands at the hands of invasive species, the return on investment in eradicating these species is huge. Today, I'm gonna hopefully put a little wow a little inspiration into your fuel tank. I've had the privilege of traveling the world with these groups to see their work in various far-flung places. And I truly hope that the, the, this work continues for eradicating invasives from archipelagos is technically very difficult. And I really wish you well over the next few days. It is with some reverence that I stood before the poles in Skungwai. These poles capture a supernatural imagination of an entire culture. And it's something quite, quite unique and something to be treasured. I'm grateful to Greg Howard of Island Conservation for he took the gamble of bringing me to Haida Gwaii and Guayanas and the project of the Haida Nation uh, and in conjunction with Parks Canada for the Nightbirds Returning Project. This project sought to eradicate rats from key islands in the archipelago to allow the ancient Morellets a chance to breed successfully without pred predation. For me, the trip was very focused upon science and the art of executing eradication. The photographs in this section will feature a lot of people and a lot of activity from the handling of poisons to the monitoring of post-eradication efforts with camera traps 
the focus was on at logistics and execution. And underneath that story, there is a unique and important component that got, got missed by myself. And it's taken me a decade to realize that lesson. And it's a lesson that I'll come back to in the uh, closing arguments of this presentation. But in Haida Gwaii, the problem started in 1774 with Juan Cuaros and the first arrival of the Spanish and the British ships. They kicked off the otter, otter trade that impacted the kelp beds because the sea urchins could suddenly ravage themselves on an abundant food source, thereby kicking off a trophic decline, decline in the marine environment as forage fish lost their nurseries. Meanwhile, deer and rats invaded the, the, the territories. And as, we've seen, as we will see, significant loss of uh, biodiversity in terms of plant life and flora and in the case of the seabirds over 50 percent of their population have been lost as you look at these aerial slides of the archipelago the complexity uh, of an eradication begins to dawn it is not simple like a remote isolated island as a consequence the work of this workshop is going to be imperative to figure out strategies that are highly effective in such a complex environment. South of Maui lies the island of Kaho Alave, an island where a Melikomo needs to be chanted before one has permission from the Polynesian deities to arrive. The island was sequestered by the US Army after Pearl Harbor and had been used as a bombing range for over 50 years. Sadly, all the topsoil has been eliminated. The seabirds have long left, left the island and cats and rats now dominate what precious biodiversity is left. Rewilding Taho Alave is a significant undertaking. Unexploded bombs need to be removed for the hard process of rebuilding soils to the basic peely grass can enable the beginnings of an ecosystem to be restored. The promise here is important because it was once an important seabird breeding island and if an ecosystem can be rebuilt it is a refugia for future seabirds. Amazingly tucked in the corners of the island are ancient Polynesian shrines, the navigation bell rock to the worship points where the offerings are made to, to the gods. Returning to our helicopter to Maui, one flies over regions of conservation endeavors where fenced off areas flourish with biodiversity compared to the denuded landscape where the axis deer and the wild boar and goats have impacts. Clearly, the earlier interceptions occur, the quicker biodiversity and rewilding the process occurs. As you take a last dip with, below the ocean in Hawaii, the connection between functional terrestrial ecosystems and their nutrient runoffs from guano into the ocean begins to be apparent. Okinoshima lies 50 nautical miles offshore from Fukuoka, southern Japan, in the Sea of Genkai. Masa, here at the Natural History Museum of Fukuoka, is the team lead in charge of assessing Okinoshima for a recovery plan. Just 30 Japanese murrelets now use the island for breeding. Their population decimated by the presence of rats. The rats, which have in turn, have now turned their sights on the population of 200,000 shearwaters. Unfortunately, there is a huge cultural consideration that needs to be assessed and navigated, for the island is a Shimanwara, a region of purity. Arriving at Akinoshima, one is required to take a naked cleansing ocean ceremony with the monks that guard the island. For the island, it is so sacred because it is here 
that the Chinchu deities birthed the empresses that look over the Japanese nation. Introducing poison to this region of purity is highly problematic. And furthermore, it impacts the very tenets of the Shinto nation that regard all life as sacred. The island of Palmara lies a thousand nautical miles south of Hawaii. Upon arrival, the noise of the plane has spooked swarms of birds into the sky. It is literally wheeling with frigate birds and boobies and their noise. It is awe-inspiring to stand in a place of such intense biodiversity. This island, 10 years ago, however, was heavily impacted with rats. And Alex Wegman, the chief scientist of the program that led the eradication, took a long time to unravel the complexities of the island. Initially as a Greenhorn PhD student, his job here was to resolve whether Pandarus and Pans uh, Pisonius endemic trees were not recruiting, the th and which was thought to be the root cause of the collapse of the breeding colonies of the birds. Not so. It turns out a very intercomplicated relationship between the rats and the impact upon the birds and the recruitment of trees was, pre was present. But now, 10 years later, this island has exploded in biodiversity. And one of the key findings of this environment is that the huge return of guano leaching into the surrounding uh, marine environment has caused the reefs to explode with life as both the balance of terrestrial and marine ecosystems has been restored. While stuck in the mud, literally in a lagoon in Palmara, I had the luxury of time to reflect upon the genetic tree of life that's captured by the Hillis plot. As an engineer, this plot really uh, captures my imagination for all the interconnections and the information that flows between all species is somehow wrapped up here. And I also got to thinking that its dimensionality could be used a form of a bioindex for any given place. And so areas that had been depleted in biodiversity and heavily impacted have huge sections missing uh, from the simplest of outer leaves to the deep core DNA that we all share. So out of these reflections and sort of plotting the global biodiversity as a function of genetic diversity, I had this notion that the work that we do when we rewild is really the beginnings of an accretacy the very opposite of the Anthropocene. That is a period of human endeavors where the conditions are created such that biodiversity on Earth truly flourishes. And so by using that language of Cretocene in the, in the prom, with the promise of rewilding, I think that the work that you and the teams of scientists that rewild places is truly important work. And I thank you for it. Island conservation has a long-standing history of working in the Galapagos with many successes, notably the recovery of the habitat by elimination of goats on Pinzon has allowed the recovery of the wild tortoise population. And most recently in 2019 on Simon Norte, the cost of eliminating invasives by the use of heavy lift drones and the subsequent increase in human safety during these operations was successfully demonstrated. These little pictures of biodiversity here were all taken on Simon Norte, but I want to take you to Floriana, where the islands are heavily predated upon by the rats and the birds sadly further predated upon by the cats. 
Uh, Floriana is a human occupied island with a subsistence farming community of about 150 folks. And so the thought to deploy poison bait amongst their food and water systems was very concerning and ultimately resulted in a no-go from the community. However, working carefully with the community over four years, the problems of food security, water security, uh, and chick uh, predation were examined. And as a consequence, solutions brought to bear, which included supplying shipping containers for the storage of food and uh, supplies to, in a rat-proof environment, digging massive water uh, uh, lagoons so that in the wet season water can be stored for the dry season and creating modern chicken coops that allowed still free range but con contained environments in which predation can occur have opened the pathway to uh, a 2021 eradication uh, in uh, Floriana of the rats and the cats. Importantly Island conservation's work on Floriana has resulted in peer-reviewed papers that demonstrate that eight of the 17 strategic development goals by the United Nations are actually supported and enhanced when biodiversity uh, issues and rewilding is undertaken in any given environment. A lesson learnt here is that when culture and biodiversity issues intersect, the building of trust is a critical skill in the expansion of working protocols to allow these eradications to proceed. So we come full circle and we return to witness the beginning of the restoring the balance program where the impact of deer upon the islands in addition to rats had been recognized and the first attempts to remove deer from specific islands has been undertaken. Since that work of a few years ago uh, it has become realized that this is an archipelago and re-invasion of the islands by both rats and deer readily occur. This provides the motivation for our work in the next two days on how to develop solutions that can truly provision and wide eradication. I argue the work can be no more important than it before. The strength of the flora is diminishing. There are places in Haida Gwaii where it is almost impossible to find Devil's Club, for example, within the bounds of Guayanas. The surrounding nutrient flow because of falling bird populations is further impoverishing the marine environment and yet we have the opportunity to intervene and course correct. The value of this place is immeasurable because if you reflect as you stand before the poles in Skungwai and reminisce of that, that those great moments for those of us who've had that chance, embedded in those poles is the supernatural culture that reflects animals and flora of all species from frogs to toads to wood to, to whales it's all part I don't know if you can hold me there, but I got muted and unmuted and it's thrown my presentation. Um, can everybody still hear me? Could Bob kill you? Can you, can you wait? I'm so sorry, Andy, that was a technical failure um, on my part that it just messed up. Sorry about that. It's all good. We can handle it. No panic. I just need to find my sorry. mouse if I can. <laughs> it's all good. So I'm going to have to, can everybody still see my screen? Yes, Andy. Perfect. So um, um, 
I the because it's a where is this not? I'm working? so sorry. Uh, it's all good. We will bear with us. We will make a uh, Monty Python show out of all of this somehow someday. <laughs> I can't. My mouse has disappeared. Here we go. There we go. All right. Get to the end of my presentation. All right. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So actually, no, I'm not. I'm not. Okay. Take your time and don't All rush. Right. We, we were about here. So I can't re cue them without going back to the beginning. So I will now jump in verbally. Um, so we have this beautiful seed bank. Um, Bob uh, Kiljus and Rob and I had this great day chasing around the islands, finding the last pockets of where these wild flowers. Uh, endemic wildfowls had still survived on the island um, and I just want you all to you know there's this huge re uh, reserve of biodiversity that's capable of exploding if we can make great progress on the um, on the uh, on the eradications but the point that I really wanted to close out with is this sequence of slides here where there's two important points here is the first cedar seedling that we notionally found on Ramsey after the deer eradication. And here on the Tar Islands are Barb and Kildus <laughs> and Robin <laughs> Irvine from Park Centre in the And there's two comments that I wanted to make. The first is that with Barb and, 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 and um, Kildus in conversations here, it is, for me, metaphoric or symbolic, if you like, of two great bodies of knowledge coming together. You've got Western science and tr First Nation traditional knowledge truly coming together to form this consilience of a wider body of knowledge that hopefully we can exploit to make the islands, get, create an eradication on the islands. And that is important to me, particularly but I suspect orders of magnitude more important to Barb and her nation, because this is Barb with that first cedar tree. This is a totem pole. This is a cedar canoe in a thousand years. And so biodiversity, culture, human well-being, all of it for me is utterly wrapped up. And um, that treasure, we are, you know, is important that we keep these places alive and well in the world. And so I really hope that during the course of this symposium, we get some great ideas on how to advance the science of eradication for archipelagos. Thank you. That wraps me up. I now have the privilege of messing with my computer for a few moments, where I bring back Kiljus and Nancy, who will give you the next 20 minutes of the presentation. Nancy and Kiljus, I actually have your slide Andy, deck Andy, I'm going to interject so, because I got a more recent version. This is Robin, so I'm going to share my screen so if okay, you could okay, give over the controls. Yep, I will just do that right now. Um, I will need Stephanie to make me able to share yes, my screen. Yes, I am just looking you up to do that right now. Sorry about that. Thanks. And then uh, Kiel, Juice, and Nancy, you'll just have to say uh, la prochaine diapositive or next slide, please, or whatever that is in Haida. Okay. So <clears throat> this is a learning experience for me, everyone. Um, so please bear with us. I am um, learning to say no to everything that drifts past in the way of being involved with all kinds of things um, has, has made me late today. So here we are, Hawa to the technical people and Hawa to all of you for, for coming on this little voyage with Nancy and I. Nancy is my dear sister and in in the days before uh, we we had to use use just electronics to communicate, we traveled quite extensively 
around different parts of the world working on different things and different places. And today we're going to travel through the ether and bring it all to you in the way of what's here on Haida Gwaii and some of our history. So we'll start now. Can I have the next slide, please? So our old stories tell us that here on Haida Gwaii, we've been since it was both dark and light. And the picture you see in front of you is Hana Kothli or um, Skidigit Inlet. And over on the far shore is Tail Kun. And this is from, from my front patio. So welcome to my front patio. Next, please. And we'll, we'll do the talking for the next little while. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. And how are for inviting me to participate in this with you? And Andrew, thank you for those amazing, inspiring uh, photos and and commentary. Truly remarkable. For me, um, I've been working and learning from Haida elders for coming coming on for 50 years and mostly learning about the rich knowledge of plants and the importance of plants and Haida culture and life ways. So here we have um, just some images of plants that have great cultural importance for Haida. And um, these are some of the, the species that are at risk now from the introduced animals mostly, but also invasive plant species um, that are taking over and eliminating some of these plants. Next slide, please. The Haida uh, have names for a good 120, maybe 150 different species of plants. Um, the ones here, especially the wildflowers on, uh, on I believe, Limestone Island, uh, this was an area where deer were removed and you can see um, what happens when, when the plants are allowed to flourish. You have the flowers and then you have the pollinators and then you have the birds that feed on the insect pollinators. And so as the work of Jean-Louis Martin shows uh, and his colleagues, the, it's a huge web of life that supports these important Haida plants. Hlaia, uh, the high bush cranberry, and uh, Na'a, the springbank clover, are two other species that are important, have cultural importance for Haida, but are uh, less and less common these days on Haida Gwaii. Next slide, please. And some of the other plants that uh, are named in the Haida language, Intling, Slakesta in the Masset dialect, Intling and Skidigit, the rice root. The wild strawberry, seaside strawberry is really important uh, even today. Fireweed, um, Salal, and uh, Jeet or Jack, the elderberry, all of those are just some examples of the plants that are important for Haida and also are potentially threatened by these invasive species. Next slide. Um, Chitlinchow, um, the Devil's Club, is an, a very important Haida plant spiritually and medicinally, and it's certainly been reduced uh, by the browsing deer and today you can only find it in places where the deer can't access for for one reason or another steep uh, cliffs and that kind of thing blueberries and you can see other understory plants here that um, are only found because the deer don't access them there next slide please 
so as we, so as we look at the plants that um, Nancy has just spoken about, you realize that if they're not on steep terrain or in places such as some of these smaller islands, uh, they are they are there for the eating, not just of from the uh, deer, but also the beaver have a big impact on them. So today, as we as we go through this, we're going to look at the changes that have happened here on Haida Gwaii. At one time, this place was known as the Galapagos of the North. And my fear is that if we don't do something, we'll end up being the Easter Island of the North. Next slide, please. As you can see, these are these animals that we're going to be discussing for the next three days are all swimmers. Um, Guigu or raccoon was introduced in the 1940s, just probably about 20 miles, if that, up the highway from Skidigat, where I'm sitting today. And Kagan Yudla um, is that's the plural for for rats. And so today we're going to be talking about both the Norwegian and the black rats. And as you can see from the picture, they swim also. Next, please. And as we look at cot or the Sitka black tail deer, you see that they're also swimmers. And they were introduced in different um, segments. First at the north end, um, around Masset Inlet, which is right at the very end, and in the 1870s. And then here in Hanakothli, or Skidigat Inlet, from between 1910 and 1925, along with the Sitka black, black tail deer, the elk, the European red, red deer, uh, they were all dropped off here so that the settlers would have a source of protein we had our sources of protein. They were mostly uh, sea going uh, protein. And so this was an introduction of something that was not um, usually here. And as you can see um, in the, the bottom picture, this is the picture that I took of the uh, buck that was wandering around Skangwai. Uh, for many years, and in 1998, Parks Canada slash Guayanas started removing them. Next, please. And Ting, the American beaver, they were introduced in 1920 in um, Iron River. I think that's supposed to be 1936 for the Massad Inlet and 1949 for Mirror Lake. Next, please. So again, climate change is a big factor. As we look at the right-hand picture, you can see what low tide looks like on a nice day. And this is at our heritage um, center, just miles up the road. And if you look at the two left-hand ones, you can see um, what with climate change and the fluctuation of warm and cold water, the impact that we are already having. These pictures on the left were taken by Mavis Mark in uh, 2003, I believe, and are indicative of things to come. You can see that uh, the the um, picnic tables and everything are getting washed in that bottom left hand picture and and so for the whole of the islands and for other islands around the world this is a big threat next please the wind also plays a huge part in this and kite kaji is the name of taking the top the heads off the trees and on the right the left hand side you can see that they're broken off 
And on the right hand side, this was taken after a, um, a hurricane force wind uh, went through Kangad Island area. And so we see big changes. And the changes aren't just the winds, it's the stability of the soil and the lack of understory. Next, please. I put this in because I wanted you to see these pictures were taken in 1900 and they were taken of the different village sites and if you look closely to each picture you can see the understory and how prolific they are. Emily Carr spoke about how she had to have Willie and Clara cut her way through the the understory in order that she could paint all those wonderful pictures and, and take the pictures that she painted the, pic, the uh, paintings from. And if you look at the bottom right, you can see that man is probably quite tall, but he looks like he's an ant compared to the understory. Next, please. Diamond Hill, this was a group that originally was set up in 2000, 2001, to look at what was happening to our forests. And so the exclosures, as we call them, um, were set up high enough so that the deer couldn't jump over, over the um, fence. And the idea was to see how resilient the seed bank was and what would happen if if the deer were kept away from the, the plants. So we, I believe these are all on Kangit Island and it shows you over the years um, what has come back and, and how prolific the seed bank is. Next, please. Browse line is, is up quite high. And if you look at 2010 on the right hand, it's grass and all these all these old village sites are impacted with the same fero ferociousness by the um the deer that are are everywhere next please sorry so we, we visited uh Skungoy many times uh and before the, uh, they started to remove some of the deer from Skangwai, um, the skunk cabbage and, the, and many other of the culturally important plants, you, you could hardly see them at all. The far left photo shows a tiny, tiny little skunk cabbage plant that's been nibbled by deer. But in the middle uh, is what's happened now that the deer have been removed mostly from skungwai. The skunk cabbage plants are growing back and, and thriving again. The same with the entling. Um, that Barb saw that, that plant for the first time after the deer were starting to be removed from skungwai. So you can see the difference uh, that just even a uh, relatively short time makes when these invasive species are removed. The next, please. Um, other culturally important plants that the deer have, uh, have browsed, we see hill, hill gadelgungs, the uh, floating leaves or medicine of the yellow pond lily. Uh, the deer have munched away the, most of the leaves on that uh, because they could access it easily when the pond is dried up a little bit. And then guaikia, one of the important medicinal plants again, uh, is, is quite toxic and, and you have to use it with great care and knowledge about how, how it is um, administered or used. But the deer seem to eat it without any problem and uh, you can see what happens to what could be a, a plant that could grow up to two meters tall. This is what happens to it when it's eaten by deer. Next slide. That's uh, Veratrum viridi. Uh, 
Kiel juice. On, on the left hand side, you can see um, that the, the roots of this spruce tree are fairly uh, shallow. And without the understory to help those trees stay upright and help anchor them when the big winds come or the drying of the soil happens and then the rain comes. These, these trees are quite um, susceptible to um, being blown over. The other thing is when you look at, look at the one on the right, you see that just moss is growing. And from speaking with uh, one of the uh, scientists, they tell me that the soil is very impoverished. And the thing that needs to happen is the understory needs to be um, brought back and allowed to grow again or given a chance to grow again. Next please. So as we look at the tree on the left, and this one's a small tree when you think about, when you think about our canoes, because our canoes were 50, 60, 70 feet long. And you look at the top right hand, that's second growth up there. Very spindly, very small, or very, very um, narrow. Um, will never ever become a, a canoe tree because of the lack of nutrients. In the, in the soil and the nutrients come from the understory, from what the burrowing birds do, from um, all the creatures that should be part of the forest. The middle one is a third generation cedar seedling, if you please, but it's been in one of those plastic wrap um, protection things and it looks like a, a wiener or something and the bottom one is is the, uh, the what's left of the cedar seedling. That's all right go ahead. Next please. Nan? So this is a, a place uh, on Morsby Island where Haida have built trails over to the west coast. Uh, it's a very important place for harvesting not only trees but blueberries and other culturally important plants. And uh, we see what's happened, as Barb said, the soil has been impacted by uh, and impoverished and the tree roots aren't able to get as deep and we get these landslides coming down uh, in places that have never had them before. It's like a maelstrom of different impacts from climate change, uh, storms, and poor soil, and impoverished plants all coming together to create these conditions. So you see where the trail was uh, went through from our friend John Dick, uh, who walked that trail many years ago when he was working as a biologist here. Uh, next slide. Barb, back to you. Yes, so the other thing that needs to be taken into consideration is the amount of logging that has been uh, done here on Haida Gwaii. If you look at the picture on the left side, this is what our forest looked like when Europeans first came to our lands. And as you can see, there's a lot of deep, deep green. If, as you look at the right hand side, you can see that most areas that are easily accessible, either because it's a river bottom or on, on flat plain areas, that it's been logged right down to and including uh, the, uh, some parts that are now in Guayanas as a protected area. The thing that I'm very proud of when I look at these pictures is there are areas 
um, of Haida Gwaii right now that have uh, been protected outside of Guayanas in total is about 51% of the total land base of Haida Gwaii has been protected. So as we look at climate change and we look at what's happening with the trees um, falling over and being eaten or gnawed down, uh, we have a big job on our hands. Next, please. This picture uh, from Jean-Louis Martin in France, and he loaned it to me uh, a long time ago, and I'm hoping that, that um, this isn't what we'll have to look at forever. The 39 times means that if you took all the forests, all the trees that have been taken off Haida Gwaii since they first started logging and we did logging, but not like this. We did selective logging. If you took all those trees that have been used through um, machines and chainsaws, they would go around the world at the equator 39 times. And, and for me, that's, that's absolutely mind boggling. Next, please. as our laws in BC have changed because of protests and concern, uh, we now hear that the bear dens have to be protected. So as you look at the hillside on the top left, you see that's, that's the tree, that's a bear den tree. And it, it's by itself, it looks very lonely but this is what logging um, is permitted to have happen here in British Columbia. Next, please. And the slides that we spoke, uh, Nancy spoke of earlier, these slides here are as a result of logging. They're not because of uh, just plain failure because of the lack of understory, but logging has assisted in eroding a good deal of our rivers, which impacts our food security. And so as we embark on this for the next two days, we need to remember that food security is a big part of this picture. And I, I put this name on here, Tulga Kungwayai. My father told me that it, it referred to all the burrowing birds that were around this whole island of uh, Lyle Island. Next, please. Gina Wadlochan Gut At Kwagit. Nancy? The Haida Kwai has a number of species that are endemic to this area and not found anywhere else in the world. And not only species like the Senecio, Senecio, Senecio and the Nucombiae um, and other ones, um, but certain places that were not glaciated during the last ice age um, have preserved uh, ancient, ancient remnants of species and as well um, varieties of plants and animals subspecies and varieties that are only found on Haida Gwaii. So it, it makes it all the more important to that these have to be preserved. Next slide, please. I know we're running short on time here, so we'll just move quickly through these. Barb, do you want to say anything? As we here? look at these, um, we, we need to remember that these are the challenges that we're faced with. Can you keep clicking your um, forward, please? And these are some of the endemic species that need to be protected, and we need to remove the introduced species in order for these to survive. Next, please. Yeah. More of the, uh, the bear, the ermine, these are 
subspecies or varieties um, of species that are only found on Haida Gwaii. So the black bears are, are special to the islands, uh, a special genetic strain of the regular black bear. So um, all, in fact, almost all of the species on the islands that have been there for a long time are genetically distinct in one way or another. Next slide, please. So we can go quickly through these. These are just the different birds that are being impacted because they have, they have developed with absence of predators. And now because their nests are on the, on the land, uh, they, they stand to be uh, deeply impacted by beavers, by, by uh, squirrels, Rats. by rats and by, ooh, come on Barbara, uh, raccoons. And our future, our future is our children. You know, they're, they're our next knowledge holders. And we want them to have the opportunity to make canoes and poles and remember the stories that go with them. Next, please. I thought originally that the beavers own crab apple trees, but that's not true. The deer eat our seedlings. The, the beavers cut down our cedar, or if they don't, the loggers cut down our cedar. Next, please. And our spruce. Our spruce were first started to be cut down when uh, the war needed the mosquito airplanes. So their, their um, fiber makeup is very important, not just to the outside world, but to us because we use their roots. We use all parts of it for medicine, for fiber and for building. Next, please. So as we look at the trees, this is a, um, the crab apple tree. This was a high status food that was served to our kill slide at, at our feasts and potlatches. And the impact of beaver, as you can see in the bottom right, the impact of deer in the middle right is, is profound. And we stand to lose so much knowledge if we don't find a way to care for all these things. Next, please. Yachgudang at laguka pantl. So that means respect and responsibility for all living things, knowing our place in the web of life. Our fate runs parallel with the fate of the ocean, sky, and forest people. And I want to say how are to the people who, next please. So, a thousand year cedar plan. This is what we're challenged with. On the left, is a, of a cedar tree. Can we get there? Next, please. And I'd like to say hawa to the Idaho holders who will be part of this symposium for the next couple of Days, a couple of scientists, the Guayanas Archipelago Management Board, and my teachers. How for everything that has brought us to this place where, as Guaganat told me, once you know, there's no excuse. Next, please. 
Andy? I just thought that Nancy and Barbara and I in our deliberations running up to this talk that wouldn't it be cool if we could take this thousand year cedar plan and the Hyder and Parks, uh, Parks Canada enable this global accretocene where these good works happen all over the world. That's an inspiration to us, Sandy, and I, I want to thank both of you for uh, having me participate in this. So that's it, we made it through it a little late, but I'm so thankful that all of you have watched our presentations. I hope that we um, will have you go home and think of how you can help those places in your neighborhood or other places that have impacts from introduced species. Thank you, everybody. And remember the Akritasin. How I killed you. How are everybody? How are I just want to note that um, thank you to everybody. I've put in an email into the chat box as Kill Juice mentioned. This uh, presentation is part of, it is the kickoff for a three-day symposium, uh, a technical symposium that is happening on Haida Gwaii where various experts and knowledge holders are coming together to discuss planning for the future of invasive species. And so if you would like more information about that um, after the symposium, please send a note to that email. And thank you so much, Nancy and Iljus, for sharing your knowledge with us today. It was really wonderful to see some of those old photographs and really making those connections back to what is happening uh, here on Haida Gwaii locally. And thank you to Andy for sharing many beautiful photos from a decade's worth of travels to such incredible islands around the world and for giving us that global perspective today. So that was extremely inspiring and um, just wonderful. And thank you everybody for sticking with us a little longer than the one hour that we thought we'd be here. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome folks. And the article preventing extinctions that I spoke to um, will also um, be available on the link that St uh, Stephanie's setting up. So you don't have to go and find it. I've got it. I've managed to get from the newspaper a, a nicely presented PDF for everybody. So uh, that will be available. So Hawa, Club, Kiljush, Nancy, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone.